Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 37. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Hello, I am here. Indeed. And we're going to be talking about the greatest living board game designer. Probably, I, I don't know why I specified living there. I don't know of any better dead board game designers. The greatest board game <laughs> designer, Vlada Kavadal. We just finished Vlada. this past weekend going to a small local convention called Vladicon, where all everyone does is play Vlada games. We got in a nice, very large game of Through the Ages, among others. Got to play yeah. the new version of Pictomania, which was fun. I'd never played that one before. But we decided it's been a while. It's It's been... It's amazing that it's taken this long to just talk about Florida. Yeah. I mean, we talk about Florida all the time. I mean, we do. Yeah. But we've never dedicated an entire episode. Florida, if you're out there listening, we greatly apologize. It should have been like episode two. Vladicon uh, is awesome. I mean, first because you're playing Vlada games all day, but um, it's just an awesome like local convention. That's something we don't talk about a whole lot. Maybe is like local board game culture. But as far as the things I've been involved in, involved in, I think it's one of the coolest things. Yeah, it's fun. They get a little space. It's uh, not like thirty to forty people show up. It's not extravagant at all. It's just it's just tables and Vlada games, pretty much. In pretty much every Vlada game. When, now, when I was going back through and researching for this podcast and looking on BGG at all of Vlada's games that he's created, there were a couple I had honestly had never heard of. But most of them, I'd say all but two or three really obscure ones, are present at Vladicon. Although, it's also interesting to know, and you'll see when we go through the list of games, that it seems like more or less... His better games have been his most popular games. The games that people don't really know about have fairly low scores on BGG. Like, they're all in the fives and sixes, which is pretty low for games. So, it seems like his success has kind of followed uh, his talent in that sense. But what we're going to go over here, I wanted to go kind of do a thorough chronological walkthrough Vlada's board game career. I don't know much about his video game career, although I do know he worked originally on video games before doing board games. So we're going to go chronologically through all the games, talk about them, and then I wanted to highlight a couple of design consistencies that you can see through Vlada's work. One thing to note about him is that he has a remarkably diverse set of games. Yeah. Some designers kind of have their thing and they yeah. stick with it. Reiner Knizia does kind of small mathy games. Stefan Feld does point salad games. Yeah, so we're going to try to talk about the things that Vlada does consistently. But it's it's not like the big picture. This is the kind of game Vlada makes. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's... he's got from one end to the other. He just released a game that is more or less an icebreaker activity that you could play it you know, a company function or something. One of those games where people like answer random questions about what would you prefer this or this all the way to one of the most popular heavy Euro games of all time. One of the most popular adventure <laughs> games of all time that are both exceptionally heavy games for, you know, well, not exceptionally. They're both on the heavier side for sure. In yeah. terms of European designers, so a huge wide range of complexity and then style yeah. of game, and then a a Pictionary style game and a word game, yeah. That are both they both take those things and one kind of turns it on its head, and the other one just kind of does it as well as we've seen with with code names. I guess that's as much introduction as we need in terms of what Vlada's Ovra is. That how you pronounce it, Ovra? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't can't pronounce, pronounce that word. You don't. You don't say French words to try to sound fancy. Ouvre. Ouvre. I think that's it. Yeah. I was gonna be. Go back to my high school French. That's yeah. That which, sounds right. Which quick side note, I have finally shifted my foreign pronunciation default to Spanish. After oh. like very very casually studying Spanish for like for about two years. So are you finally going to be pronouncing jalapeno correctly? 
No, I will purposely always pronounce that jalapeno. Just to annoy me. Yes. I hate you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk about Vlada's games. Going all the way back to 1997, where he had his first board game. According to Board Game Geek, it has 83 ratings on Board Game Geek, which is a very small number. Uh, called I- Arena, and then the subtitle is something in Latin? Czech. I was, or actually, no, yeah, it does look Latin, actually. Morituri te salutant. That seems kind of Latin-y. And I'd never, this is one of the ones I had never heard of before. It looks like a two-player kind of arena combat game. The description on Board Game Geek made it interesting. It says that the combat rules are on. Un- Unusual, well thought out, and interesting. Instead of throwing a die, you choose a number from one to six. Depending on the attack type, it might be the range might be different. On the die, and the defense is a has a certain number of guesses to find out what your attack number was. So it's like a fighting game with some hmm. bluffing involved in the attacking instead of a random factor, which is interesting. I wonder if there are like copies of that in the United States or if it was only released in the Czech Republic. Yeah, I don't know. I've never heard of it. Never I, heard of it. Um, I can't say I remember seeing this in the library at Vladicon. I don't think so. Yeah. I've looked through that library pretty extensively and yeah. never seen this one. The, f- the earliest one that I have seen in the library there is his next game, Jumping Five Years in the Future to Prophecy. Which I've seen people playing, but every time I ask, I've asked about it there, people are like, yeah, it's all right. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, it is very similar to Talisman, which is a game that a lot of people are very nostalgic for, but I haven't played. I think which is sort of an adventure dungeon crawler game, but with a lot of random elements. I believe Prophecy kind of reduces the random factor in that style of game, but it's kind of an early version of a hybrid RPG how, board game thing. Yeah, how intense was this game? I mean, is this kind of like a proto-Mage Knight? I don't think so. I think, from what I've heard, it's it's very much inspired by Talisman, so it's more along... I mean, it has... So it would have similar things to Mage Knight in terms of, like, you're leveling up a character and encountering monsters, but I don't think it's as involved as Mage Knight. It's more of a a luck thing and kind of a family weight, perhaps. I think it's weighted pretty low on Board Game Geek. But among his super early games, there are three of them. There's This is the second of them. This one has certainly been the most popular. It has the most ratings. I think it has nearly 2,000 ratings, which means it has a... You know, a solid reception, especially from that era. The third game uh, he created in 2005, so again, jumping uh, three more years, that only has 176 ratings, so again, one that's really obscure, is called Sherwood, and I couldn't find much about it on Board Game Geek. From what I could tell, it's a kind of light auction bluffing game, but I didn't get much more description than that. So... Already we see two games with bluffing as an element, and he sprinkles that in a bit in his later work, but you don't see it a lot. There's a there's kind of a bit in in uh, Dungeon Lords, but but bluffing doesn't seem to be a factor in a whole lot of his later work. So really, maybe that's something he kind of relied on in the in the in his beginning designs and started yeah. straying away from well, it. Well, okay, so in this period, he was he was designing video games prior to this. Right. And then I it looks like he had a major video game come out in 2001. Oh, really? So, what what was it? Uh, Original War is the name of the game. But so that's coming out in this early period of games. I I just kind of wonder like with the complexity of some of his the next slew of games from Vlada that we kind of get a feel that he's using his video game background to kind of manage the the, the huge weight. I, I just wonder, like this is these early ones are kind of his dabbling with 
with the kind of lighter fare. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, even you, as you talk about designing games, you've you've more seriously pursued the lighter ones, even though it's really the heavier ideas that you're more interested in. That's true. Yeah, maybe these are the ideas he felt he could execute. Anyways, after Sherwood, he gets his his first massive hit in board gaming in the next year in 2006 with Through the Ages, which I wasn't around board gaming back in 2006, but from what I understand, it ended up being a pretty big deal because yeah. it was perhaps the first or maybe the first notable civilization game that just completely ditched the map. Yeah. And it, it ditched the geographic part of civilization games, which to people before then seemed fundamental. Sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's it's, a key part of any Civ game. In, yeah. And obviously based in the early Avalon Hill Civ games and then Sid Meier's Civ games on the on the computer where the map is a big part of it. And it's always played on a map. And then he comes along and ditches the map entirely and then makes a great game. Yeah, yeah. Like a truly great game. I just think even now, having been introduced to Through the Ages way after it first came out, it was remarkable not having a map. But I, I think it's super interesting. Like we play civilization games and of course, in a game of, uh, of that scale, you're going to abstract away huge portions of civilization. And even in the map, like you have these little skirmishes where you're moving things around the board. But in the scope of a civilization that lasts a thousand years, like, sure, you're moving an, a, an army in the actual game, but it it doesn't really work in a one-to-one way with how a civilization actually works. So anyway, I sure. think it's just, it's really cool that he's the, this is the first game that strips away the map. And I think there are other, you know, the other ways in which it abstracts away civilization are super interesting in the way that leaders work, in the way that your economy works, in a way that it doesn't map one-to-one -to, -one to the way that civilization works, but uh, he's just able to do really interesting things by not worrying about this physical relationship. Yeah, and not worrying about other things as well. So it seems... It's, it's kind of a game that you would expect from someone later in their career in designing board games. Now, obviously, again, he has he had a lot of experience with computer games, so I'm sure that played a huge part in kind of the maturity of Through the Ages. But not only does he strip away the map, he reduces resources to only two things, essentially. The food and the yeah. resources. Yeah. Which allows him to, I think, create a tighter kind of noose around the neck feeling where in a game with maybe four or five different resources you're managing, you have to be a bit more plentiful yeah, in order to not completely screw someone over if one of them happens to become extremely scarce. So I think by having only two of them, Although there are other things that kind of function as resources, uh, the happy faces. You can make the scarcity that much more severe because your focus is so tight. Maybe the other thing that only having those two primary resources does is they kind of have very logical and somewhat strict things that they do. Science, Science is basically used for discovering new technology resources are used for actually building things in the game it creates a very tight loop of discovery but then actual realization of of those technologies and i think you can like as far as the game goes you can have a legit strategy that focuses on one or the other you're going to have some balance obviously well the game the game forces you like you can't do everything well and so your engine is limited by what you are worst at, essentially. So if mm -hmm. if you focus on typically between between science, food, and resources, I feel like at least at the the level that I'm playing. So someone familiar with the game, maybe really good players can can do it differently or or do it better. But I feel like I can usually do well in two of those things. Okay. And then the third one restrains my growth. 
So, for instance, in the game we played on Saturday of Vladicon, science was my limiting factor. I couldn't create as many buildings as I wanted to or upgrade my things as much as I wanted to because my science pace just wasn't such that I could grab cards when I wanted to grab them. I needed to spend more turns building that up or getting to a point where I could build that up before I could start taking new technologies. And the, the cool thing about Through the Ages is that it has this timeline, essentially, of cards, this yeah. rotating card draft that just keeps moving whether you like it or not. So it's really in a lot of games, you know, the the timing element of the game is dictated exclusively by your opponents. Yeah. In this one, it is dictated a bit by your opponents, but mainly by simply the game pushing you along. And so the major thing that new players encounter is that they tend to grab more cards than they can actually invest in from that draft, and then they end up wasting those those actions because they can never afford to invest in them. Either they can't get the, the science to lay them down, or they don't have enough people because they haven't had a good food engine, or they can't afford to build them. Yeah, that, that central drafting mechanism is absolutely brilliant. I mean, I think there are a couple of things that are really phenomenal about through the ages but that's really the kind of the central thing that drives and thematically it's just this relentless progression of history yeah the the game feels not so much that you're traveling through the ages but rather that the ages are moving and you're kind of (laughs) holding on for dear life yeah and and you're just you're just trying to make something of all this time (laughs) Especially towards the mid game, because you're like, oh man, we're already halfway through the game, but I'm, Caesar is still leading my armies, yeah. and I haven't even discovered iron yet. Julius did very well. Julius Caesar is still strong. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how much stronger he is in the first edition, Matt. Yeah, really. Have you only played the second edition? I think we played the first edition at Vladicon the first time I went four years ago. Okay. Yeah, and I've really they, they only played this a they, handful of times, but I have to say this relearning at Vladicon on, on the new edition, it, it felt so smooth. And, uh, I well, quick aside, learning through the ages, you feel like, what on earth is going on? There are so many things. I have no clue. Once you get into that loop, you kind of understand the cycle. It's really just like you enter that progression of the ages and you just understand how civilizations kind of chug along it, and it all makes sense really well it's actually very uh, i don't i don't think it's quite elegant but it it all flows very nicely and it's easy to to grasp once you're in it yeah i mean it has that mark that we'll talk about later of a lot of games and that certain aspects are incredibly well thought out and just executed perfectly and then other aspects in order to either sustain the main conceits or just to create more fun are feel almost sloppy in their execution yeah so like the way that this game handles military is interesting and i love the event deck where you seed events into the deck but they only come out later in the game at a random time yeah that thing's great how like wars are fought and how that's different than aggressions and how that's different than colonization. Yes. It's it's like more obtuse than it needs to be. Yeah. It works, but it's just a rule set that I feel like could have been streamlined down, but uh, apparently there are aspects he wanted and ultimately they do work together well and they do make sense. It just feels kind of obtuse in yeah, all the little so, distinctions you have to make. In 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 our game at Vladicon, I was the most military heavy player, and it took me a while to grasp how wars work. And by the time I grasped it, I had, for various reasons, I just completely ignored them. I just used aggressions to, to to show my might. Um, yeah, I mean, which were frankly, fine. aggressions are in many ways more powerful. Yeah. Especially in the mid game. They really stall out someone's engine. Yeah. But I mean, the economy is like trying to juggle plates at the same time, you know, like five different things at the same time. Yeah. And then the military game is this incredibly important part of the game and deliberately so. 
Vlada said, I, I saw him in an interview where he said, talking about the new edition, that, yeah, the new edition does tone down the military a hair, but it was always his design that you have to keep up with your opponents in military or you're yeah. going to lose. Yeah. It's not a game where you can kind of choose one path or another. Yeah. It this has is not to be a Cold wonders. War. This yeah, yeah. Is... It has to be a Cold War where exactly. you're, you're keeping up or you will fall behind. And that's what happened in our game, is that you had the stronger military, you were able to whittle me down, even though I had a really nice synchronization with my leader... Michelangelo. Michelangelo, yeah. which put me at, like, double the score by the mid-game. Oh, yeah, you had a huge culture lead, and then I just managed to, to put all those pieces together, all those different plates I juggled to, to the mid-game, where my economy was in a good place, my military was superior... And then I, I hit you with some aggressions. Yeah. And then launched with my economy. Yeah. And and there basically are no catch up mechanisms in Through the Ages. Yeah. Pretty much. The only <laughs> thing I can think of is Gandhi. Oh. If you right. get Gandhi, oh, right. that really puts a damper yeah. on your opponent's military and maybe you can squeeze something out in the last age. But you have to get lucky and like get him at, at, in the beginning of the third age stack of cards. Yeah, like, that's, that's one about thing, it. That's it's one a thing that really not, nasty game. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's one thing that I'm not super sure about. I mean, the progression of the ages is so rapid that I don't think the randomness of the cards really matters. But there are a few things like that. Like, if you're behind in military, Gandhi could be the difference between just losing and back in it. But the, it's your fault you're there in the first place. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But then, like, the other thing in our game was it just so happened that I got the first Calver Calvary unit and another one didn't come out for, like, an entire age worth of time. Nearly, yeah. And it would have helped immensely given the way that tactics work. But, you know, just the way that it happened. And then well, I and buried the card. I took the Calvary card even though I knew I had to hold it in my hand for, like... Most Ten of the rounds. Game. Yeah, yeah. But f for another six rounds, that meant that I was dealing with cavalry and was going to have that huge military lead. So there are a couple couple things I'm not sure about the randomness of the deck, but I don't think it's a problem just because of how quickly the ages progress. Well, for those who haven't played, we talk about this timeline, this drafting thing of the cards that keep progressing down it's roughly divided into thirds and the cards in the first third of that progression cost one action and then then the middle third costs two actions and the third the last third costs three actions so in a really intense game i think the randomness actually makes the game interesting of where yeah. certain cards are in the yeah. deck because if people are familiar with the cards they may know for instance that they really need to reach yeah. To grab that second cavalry like, card. It would have been worth it to you to spend three actions on Gandhi. If he came out early. He was the second to last card in the deck. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Whereas I was not going to waste. Well, I, Gandhi well, wouldn't I mean, help me. But, I don't but remember if point. I had an opportunity to grab that second cavalry card. But looking back. Or cavalry card. But looking back. I It would have been completely worth it for me to spend three actions on it. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, because that was a yeah. huge military distinction. I feel like the randomness it's... in which military cards you draw is actually probably more significant than the randomness yeah. in the political cards, which they did diminish in the second edition because they have the tactic, the tactics go into a shared pool. In the yes. in the first edition, that does not exist. Yeah. And so you could get really, really hosed if you just simply I love don't draw a good tactic. Thematically, card. I love that. Oh, you know? and thematically it, it works. It yeah. cost two actions to learn another culture's tactics, basically. Which is completely reasonable thematically. Oh yeah. Um and it balances the, the luck out a bit. Yeah. The second edition's clearly better. Yeah, yeah. It it makes small changes, but I think they're all better. So one thing that might be clear from the conversation, but I, I wanna say is like this is a heavy game with lots of hard micro decisions and, and macro strategy. But I think it's it's so much about understanding where you are compared to the other civilizations. So in, in that sense, it's like the best kind of Euro, right? 
Well, it has a really cool learning curve where you can play it to just kind of figure out the game and figure out how all the different resource cycles work and the engine cycles and the feedback loops and all that. And you have a great time. That's kind of your first couple games. And then there's an entirely different layer when you start to remember certain leaders or plan for certain types of cards or think about strategies and have to adapt based on what when the cards actually come out. And so it remains engaging throughout the process of learning how to play better, which is really something that separates good from great games a lot of the time, I feel like. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We've been talking about this one for ages. Yeah, let's move on. I I mean... Oh, I, I, I just uh, I just figured it out, man. Oh, good. Oh, good. <sighs> Moving on, another game in 2006 he released is Grenoland, I think it's pronounced, which is, I assume, an ancient Nordic pronunciation of Greenland. Yeah. I haven't played it. They were playing it at the con. Yeah. And I heard it was pretty good. I it, think it's a sort of... It looked fine. They were having fun. Yeah. I think it's a sort of resource collection euro game with some negotiation elements it was described to me as having a lot of negotiation but then i looked at it and it looked very yeah resource mappy yeah yeah but i guess there's there's some kind of negotiation about disputed territories i think what it is is that the the land pieces produce the resources but multiple people can have like resource gathering buildings on those land pieces so if there are multiple people there, they have to work out a division of those resources. Mm-hmm. I think that's it. Anyway, I think next year at Vladikon, I'll make it a priority to play this one. Because it didn't seem particularly long, and I'm, I'm curious about it. Also, I should note that starting in 2006 with Through the Ages, we get five years of Pro- truly prolific. extraordinary <laughs> output from Vlada. Yeah. 2006 through 2011 is incredible. Before we get to some of the big hits, though, we have the first game of 2007, which I assume is in Czech, uh, Kamen, Zbrane, and Papir, which apparently is translated into rock, paper, weapons. And I looked at a couple pictures. It looks like it's a medieval setting, and you're, you have little wooden pieces, you're building buildings, and apparently a rock, paper, scissors mechanism is incorporated into it. Another kind of not widely distributed game. I'm curious about rock, paper, scissors kind of being incorporated in a larger game, but I don't think I'll ever get a chance to play this one and based on what I see. Do. I mean, kind of, but this, it made it, the description made it sound like it was like the main mechanism was rock, paper, scissors, which, you know, is interesting. But then we get to Galaxy Trucker, his other release in 2007, in the first of his real-time games. Yeah. Um, in fact, two in a row real-time games from him. Galaxy Trucker being the first one, and then Space Alert the year after. And this is kind of his two-part real-time space game releases. And both of them are hilarious and wonderful, I think. Yeah. Galaxy Trucker... I think it was a fairly significant hit for him uh, coming off of Through the Ages and really is kind of, I would say, a heavy family game. Like, I think it fits into kind of the family game space, but it's certainly not necessarily easy to learn. Like, it's it's like for gamers, it would fall into like medium light, but it really feels like a family game. Well, it's family in the sense that like, you build a nice spaceship, and then you put your pieces on the track, and you flip over some cards. Well, no, which, it's it's w- family which, in that you're like you have that real time like element of like trying to grab something faster than the other person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have a lot of humor, and it's got a little bit of a cartoony style, art style to yeah. it, and I yeah, you get but, to laugh at other people as their ships fall apart. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but even just the way that it progresses, like it kind of reminds me of like a an adventure scenario where you're just kind of like we're gonna flip over a bunch of cards and do what they say. Yeah, but but anyway, yeah. So that's the family side. But it's, but then it's brutal. It's also a really mean game, and we'll get to kind of a classification I have for this. But it's a game in which the game itself, like navigating the complexity of the game, is part of the difficulty and fun of it. 
in that you are trying to quickly visually assess each tile you grab better than the other people and figure out where to put it on your ship. So for those who haven't played, basically there are a bunch of these square tiles of different ship parts and you have a little board in front of you which shows the outline of where you're allowed to put these parts and there are guns and shields and booster rockets and crew crew quarters crew quarters uh storage units yeah for for goods that you pick up and then if we talk about the expansions there are variations on everything yes we won't talk about the expansions necessarily <laughs> and the first section of the game of, of each round of the game is a real-time phase where you're quickly grabbing these with one hand only and deciding how to construct your ship as fast as possible. And he has this little sand timer thing where at any time after the sand timer runs out, you can flip it over to the next stage to put pressure on the other players. Yeah. And then you have a deck of cards that simulates your your route through space and you encounter pirates and asteroids or meteors and all kinds of other hazards. Yeah. And essentially the best ship is going to do best and be able to transport the most goods without exploding. Yeah. And just it, a clever game. Just so clever. Yeah. And like you can, you can do really well by being super fast and getting to things first, but then you better be able to fight off the pirates because you will see those first. But if you can, you'll be rewarded very well. Or you can be a little slower, but just have massive storage capabilities. If anything's left by the time you get to it. Uh, it just has all these great possibilities, I think. Yeah. It also has one of my favorite turn order mechanisms, which he also uses in uh, uses a variation in Pictomania, which I like to call the hubris-based turn order system. Because once you finish your ship, you can grab whatever turn order spot you want. Yeah. And then when other people finish, they grab one of the ones that left. So if you finish really quickly, maybe you don't have the best ship because you finished before other people. And you could grab the first spot. But the way the scoring or the way the, 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 the second phase of the round plays out, whoever's in front has to deal with the biggest obstacles. Yeah. So... If you got went really fast, but you don't think you have a great ship, maybe you grab number three or something. But if you're confident, you grab the, that first spot and then hope that you can fend off the worst enemies. Which is, it's great. It's hilarious. Yeah. It's starting the trend of the funny rulebook thing yes, that was, Vlada I, and CGE have done many times. I was going to say, the rulebook is absolutely hysterical. I mean, huge credit to Vlada. I think I've heard also the translator, because um, Vlada works in Czech, I think. I mean, he's fluent in English, I think, or at least mostly fluent. Yes. I don't know yeah. if he... I, I mean, I think he... I assume his, his games are created in Czech. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I know that there has been a translator involved in some places, and, you know, mm -hmm. credit there, too, because whoever, whoever had, has worked on these rule books... They are the funniest rule books starting, you know, Galaxy Trucker, Space Alert, we'll talk about shortly. Oh, the dungeon games are funny. Yeah. yeah. And I also, looked and I looked and I'm like, is this really just a CGE thing or is it a Vlada thing? And CGE, a lot of their other non-Vlada games are don't have the humor. Yeah. Alchemist does. Okay. It has a funny rule book, but Zulkin doesn't at all. Pulsar doesn't at all. I don't know about like Last Will. It kind of has a funny premise, so it might have a humorous rule book. But the combination of them and Vlada on their rule books is absolutely f hilarious. And also it has a bunch of really good expansions and apparently an incredibly yeah. good app, although I haven't tried it. I've heard good things about the app. I mean, the expansions are that really good expansion style that takes a game that you've kind of gotten to expert level at and then it makes you feel like a novice again yeah moving on to space alert we've talked about this game a lot i think it's one of the best cooperative games ever made and certainly the one that inspires the most teamwork and its expansion is one of the exp best expansions ever made short recap it's a cooperative real-time game you're on a spaceship and all kinds of Threats are coming at you, alien ships and alien borders on your ship, and you're doing a programming track. Each person is laying cards down on a programming track 
to try to run throughout the ship and hit the correct buttons to ward off those threats. And then again, in the second phase, just like in Galaxy Trucker, you resolve all the programming to yeah, sometimes I, hilarious results. Unlike Galaxy Trucker, you don't have any agency in that you're just playing out the programming. Right. But it's always exciting and tense. And if you feel like you did really well, then you feel nervous because you think that something you feel like you're too confident. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's hilarious to see the alien attacks play out. It's great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Space Alert, I mean, it won. I'm looking at the box right now. It did win a special Spiel Award. I, I'm sure it sold well, but man, it, it doesn't get a lot of talk now, I feel like. Even compared to other real-time games. Really? I feel like I hear about Escape a lot more as a real-time cooperative game. But I think Space Alert is absolutely brilliant and holds up to anything that's coming out. I mean, you know, you hear a lot about like Captain Sonar, and Captain Sonar is a great game, but yeah, I think Space Alert still beats it. I mean, Space Alert is... Again, it's not elegant, but it's such a refined experience. It's like the experience is just boiled down. That cooperative, real-time, intense... Yeah, you're right. It's not the most elegant game, but what he put in there is just fun on top of fun on top of fun. Yeah. He didn't pack oh, yeah. it in Isn't with any game? waste. Isn't this the game that there are a couple things that were like, this is ridiculous. He just did that because it's so much fun. I mean, there's looking out the window, which is probably the, the funniest yeah. rule yeah. of any game. It's another hubris-based me- mechanism. Yeah, right. <laughs> where you can do this useless thing just to get some points. But if you you know neglected to shoot down that last ship in your rush to look out the window... Uh, you could doom everyone. It's wonderful. That was his only 2008 release. Moving on to 2009, we get the first of his dungeon collection of games. And by collection, I mean two games. But the very first one is Dungeon Lords, which hmm. is his first worker placement game, I believe. Unless Grenoland is one. Unless it, it has some aspect of it. But Dungeon Lords is his first worker placement game. And I guess... Only those Dungeon Lords and Dungeon Pets is the only time he's done worker placement, although Dungeon Pets combines it with an auction thing. But this is one we are going to severely disagree on because I think Dungeon Lords is quite enjoyable. And if I remember correctly, you despise it. I don't really despise it. I disliked it the first time I played it. and I think we got you to play it one more time. Yeah, and I, I don't have a real desire to play it more. And that revolves around the central action mechanic yeah so it's a, which i guess is unique but i just don't like he softens it up in dungeon pets which has, i really enjoyed for the i mean yeah. I, dungeon pets i played for the first time at vladicon this year and i very much enjoyed i i should probably revisit dungeon lords again but anyway yeah. talk about dungeon lords so how it works is it's a worker placement game where you are in charge of a dungeon and you want and explores you know heroes of other games come in and try to conquer your dungeon but you do not want it to be conquered and it's actually a quite heavy euro game where there are eight different action spaces and there are three spots on each of those spaces and what'll happen is that everyone has a card relating to each of those spaces and you lay down face down three cards so you're basically doing a very small programming thing because you lay them out in, in sequence and then you kind of all go around in turn order and like put your little worker on wherever you wherever your first card indicates and then your second then your third and then all of those actions resolve the interesting thing is that each of the spots on the action spaces do the same thing but in slightly different ways so for instance the one that lets you dig out extra tunnels in your dungeon the first spot i believe only lets you do two two spaces the second spot there lets you do three spaces and the third one lets you do four but you have to then pay an extra imp to do it which is one of your resources your your little minion imps one of them something costs free but only if you get the second spot so what you're trying to do is figure out what you need to do but also you're trying to predict what your opponents will do so you can try to get in the exact worker placement spot that you want. Yeah. And then after each round, the two cards that you selected for the, the second and third spots 
are slid up on your player board and then you don't have access to them for the next round. So you get a little bit of information about what your opponents can do, but you're still trying to guess at what they're doing. So it's a, there's always this kind of push your luck feeling to it because huh. maybe you try to work it out so it's more flexible, but maybe you're really trying to pinpoint a particular spot. And on top of that, the game's just really hard to score points. It's one of the games, and he's done this a couple of times, where he says that if you score positive points, you've won the game. Yeah. Some people just win more than others. He did that also in Galaxy Trucker. Yeah. Now remind me, there are kind of phases of the game where there are rounds of these actions that happen. And then at some point, you go and like meet the the villains or the, the, yeah. the attacking villains i guess and and there's kind of an ordered thing where if you get there first you have you have to fight the first one which might be better or something like that it depends on how evil you are so that one of the resources is like your evilometer is another one of those games that's very funny and then whoever's the most evil gets like the champion guy who's way buffed out compared to the other yeah the other adventurers going into your dungeon and you're like recruiting monsters and then there's this little phase where you kind of line up your monsters or and or your traps and try to capture the adventurers that come into your dungeon. So it's a little yeah. kind of mini game that plays out how good your dungeon is. Yes, and that's where the majority of the points are scored. Correct, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else is just trying to get a good dungeon so you can score well on that. Yes. Yeah. And then it's got all kinds of other rewards at the end of the game for accomplishing certain things. But yeah. Yeah. it's one of those games where it really tries to quantify in victory points just being good at the game. Yes. So yeah, different aspects yeah, of yeah. your dungeon and such. But the... I, I don't love it, but I think it's a yeah. pretty good game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, okay, let's talk about the thing that I don't like. What I found in the four-player game that I recall playing most recently is the, the, the action selection, the way it's done with face-down cards – and like you said, you're you're trying to figure out what other people are doing, kind of jockeying for position on these eight different sets of action tracks. It ends up being somewhat chaotic. And I, I use the word chaotic very specifically. It's not really possible to predict in a useful way what other people are doing. So you might you might really need that third slot action. That lets you do the thing three times because if you can't do the thing three times, you're not going to be able to beat the champion that you're slotted to to face or something like that. Because there are too many people making too many different decisions, it's just really chaotic about where you're going to land. That does that make? Do you see what I'm saying? It makes sense, but and, and I think I think it's ultimately a push your luck thing. And I remember that game I, where you got frustrated, and I was observing that you were taking a lot of risks. Of like being dependent on getting a particular spot. And part of I think of yeah. the skill of the game is not putting yourself in those positions where you have to get a certain spot. I guess my issue is more that that being the central mechanic, it just kind of annoying that that's a central mechanic when really you're trying to mitigate those randomness factors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just a matter and, of taste. And, and I, I totally accept that that's a matter of taste i don't like it i find that's the decision when i'm making decisions in that game i'm most like well i don't really care because i know that i don't have control and that bothers me <laughs> no, that yeah. makes sense yeah yeah, yeah yeah i mean i i fully admit dungeon lords is certainly one of a more polarizing game than many of his designs one thing that i, I there are pros and cons to this the dungeon series of games have a different kind of artwork and i'm almost surprised that these came after the space games because the space alert and galaxy trucker feel so much more refined in many ways to me really the boards are just very busy in the dungeon games yeah but they're and, intentionally so it's like yeah they are no they it's are a bunch of little in jokes it, and it, funny it, situations and this is, i mean yeah. and this is why i say it's pros and cons they're hilarious and if you look at the details like I mean, in Dungeon Pets, there's a there's yeah. a part of the board where they're pl like the little imps are playing Dungeon Lords. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, but at the same time, as far as 
kind of graphic design goes, I think it's, you could argue it's pretty oh, disorienting. I don't think so at all. I think it's actually quite good. And it's one of the, I think Dungeon Lords is some of the best visual style of any game I've played. I think in yeah, terms of like I quality of production, that. I think Space Alert's a clear loser among his CGE games. Space Alert really? doesn't look great. I think it looks way better. I, that's interesting. I didn't realize there would be such a difference in opinion on that. Yeah, there's I nothing. Think, Space, I think Space Alert is, Alert is functional. In, is incredibly functional in a hilarious way that matches everything but about the game. But there's nothing theme and mechanics. There's nothing about the visuals on the board that communicates it. It's everything else about the game that makes it funny and whimsical and, Space and exciting. The board's hilarious. I mean, it's it's a funny looking spaceship. the The whole button thing is is funny. There aren't the kind of in jokes in like if you study the map, you're not going to find hilarious things hidden in the way that Dungeon Lords has. Right. All you're going to see is yeah. gray interior spaceship, the three buttons, which is admittedly funny, but oh, I think it's far gray more interior functional. and like piping. It's like far... that's the only yeah. artwork in the game. No, but what I'm saying is it all works together theme mechanics oh i think the artwork could have been greatly improved to to make the game more visually interesting huh. on space alert I I, the artwork does nothing i think it's brilliant i think i think the entire like i mean just the fact that we're hitting a b and c buttons uh in the way right, that but that's, that's written, the mechanism that's funny right looking yeah. at the board it's not funny I disagree. I think it's because the mechanisms play out visually in that way that makes it funny. I mean, it's not. it wouldn't be funny if the rulebook just said hit A, but then like you don't see that there's a hilariously large A button. I, I mean, know. that's all it's got going yeah. for it, I think. No, no, no. And, um, I mean, my main point isn't that Space Alert is funny. My main point is I think that it's funny while being functionally better than, than Dungeon Lords. I don't know. Interesting. I didn't I don't think expect there's disagreement anything there. non-functional about Dungeon Lords. The iconography is very clear. It's incredibly busy. Yeah, but the parts you need, to, like the gameplay parts, are very clearly laid out. Sure, but I think a lot of design is not distracting from the important parts. I think Space Alert does that by just not having busyness. It's all fine, and like I said, they're all hilarious. <laughs> I, I I'm honestly really do not understand. Why you yeah. think that at all? No, like I honestly was surprised looking at the timeline that the space games came first because I was like, well, those are just more refined uh, visual designs in in my opinion. I could not d disagree huh. more. I, I'm honestly I'm really, really surprised. I'm really space surprised Space Alert too. is one of the uglier games we own. I don't think so. I think Dungeon Pets is incredibly ugly. What? It's hilarious. You see the it's design ugly. of the little creatures; like they're, it's wonderful. The, the colors, the little like the warm. colors are bad. What do you mean the colors are bad? The they're colors, vibrant. Yeah, but the, but in a way that is muddy. It's muddy. What? No. Yeah, it's I, vibrant blues and greens and browns and reds and like yellows, dark maroons on on uh, brown backgrounds. I what? The imps are dark maroon. I I don't know. I'm I cannot believe this. Anyways, let's move on before we talk about this forever. <laughs> the next game he released in 2009 is Bunny Bunny Moose Moose, the silliest of all his games and one of the strangest games I have ever played in my life. Very strange. It's like Simon says but with weird Germanic poetry. <laughs> yes. That's and it's harder than it looks. I mean... It looks like a silly kid's game, but it's actually fairly difficult. Yeah, no, and that's kind of... I think that's the rub on this game, is it's a game that I looked at and was like, that is hilariously silly. I'm gonna, oh, Well, I mean, I thought I'm going to... I bought it for my uh, fiancé's family, because they're kind of... They have a silly sense of humor. Yeah. They like lighter games. And we didn't love it. But I think we had more fun playing it with our heavy gamer group. I mean, after a few beers. After a few beers. Very important. I don't think it's a brilliant game. But no, like absolutely not. Late in the night. It's 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 absolutely a, okay, it's midnight or one in the morning. We don't really want to go home, but we don't want to spend any time thinking kind of game. Well, it's like you've, had, fits, you've had three beers. It fits beers. in that spot perfectly. Yes, yes. You've had three beers, but you want to pretend that you're thinking really hard. Yeah. Simon says with Germanic poetry, that's 
that's Bunny Bunny Moose Moose. The next game is, is I think, the final one that I'd never heard of called Babes in the Wood. And it only has six ratings on BGG, also released in 2009. So, I mean, clearly didn't get any kind of wide release. And it was a kid's game themed around Hansel and Gretel. And you it, it'll actually look pretty cool. You like physically building a little cardboard house as you play. But I know nothing else about it. 2010, he released That's two games. That's what I was thinking when I... When it said Babes in the Wood. <laughs> I mean, clearly they didn't spend a lot of work translating it. Or maybe whoever created the BGG page did a, an ad hoc translation or something. 2010, he released two games I haven't played. Uh, the first one is Travel Blog, which I did see people playing at a Vladicon before. It's It looks like a light geography game where... You're tasked with figuring out how to navigate the world efficiently. So, like, go from A to B while crossing the fewest number of borders. Things like that. So, looked looked mildly interesting, but that's about all I know about it. And then Sneaks and Snitches, which is a game I had heard about, but did not realize it was a Vlada design until I did my research earlier. And I think it's just a bluffing it's like a bluffing set collection negotiation game. So you're trying to collect certain sets, but there's like, I don't know if there's a trader or if people just have different incentives and there's a, some kind of bluffing mechanism with it. But it didn't seem particularly exciting to me. In 2011, we get a Tw- pretty 2011, ins- insane This might be my favorite output. year. Yeah. Just in, in terms of ridiculous output. So... We'll go lightest to heaviest. He releases Pictomania, which, as I said, we played the second edition of, the 2018 second edition, uh, which was, I, I think, released at Gen Con, or at least they started selling at Gen Con. I, you can pre-order it from retailers now. Might be out in a month or so. I know there were some differences in the first edition, but this is when the first edition was released, and this is basically his take on Pictionary. Yeah. And it's delightfully cruel. It's great. It's yeah. like the Vlada level of cruel that only he can do. Because how it works is that, at least in the second edition, there are three sets of eight words, and everyone has their own seven. little... Seven? Oh, yeah, seven words, sorry. And everyone has their own little drawing apparatus in the second edition it's paper and pencil I, I believe in the first edition it was a marker dry erase thing and you're given a random card and number which highlights and only you see it what word you're actually trying to draw yeah. everyone's given yeah. that so there are and 21 they, words on the board yeah one of them you are assigned to draw and then everyone starts drawing at the same time and then after you're finished drawing you can start guessing at what other people are drawing And it works so that the first, it works like the Magic the Gathering stack, where the first person to put down their number guess of what word someone's drawing gets the most points when that gets resolved from that person. And so you're frantically trying to draw something legible and coherent because you get points or you lose points if people can't guess yes. your work you're yeah. drawing and, I, and, and trying to be the fastest at it and guess everyone else's drawing fastest but <laughs> it goes through go four on. rounds the first round is you get like objects that are somewhat yeah, okay. similar let me say real quick yeah so at least in the second edition when the words go up on the board there are three lists of seven words and the thing is The seven words on a particular list are very similar. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to think of one of the... So one of the early first round ones was like, I think like pen, pencil, and then things like comb, brush. So... All things vaguely long. Yes, exactly. So you have to be somewhat careful. I mean, it's not just about drawing the thing. It's about differentiating it from the other six words on that thing. Yes, and then by the second round, you'll get like a list of movies, like a list of sci-fi yeah. <laughs> and fantasy movies. And it goes through four rounds. By the fourth round, it's, it's like, like abstract nouns. It's like aggravation, <laughs> impatience, uh, <laughs> disdain. Like it's just, a, it's really abstracted, non-visual think, things. Yeah, I think we in the yeah, but they're not all abstract. I think we actually skipped the list that was like all obscure female characters in literature. 
Oh yes, and we were just like we skipped. Well, I didn't it. know. Oh, I didn't. I wasn't filmi- familiar with right. the characteristics right. of yeah. a couple of them. Yeah. But like, can you imagine trying to differentiate obscure female characters in literature from one another while like frantically trying to finish a drawing? Yeah, I mean, it's such a brilliant idea. Based on first impressions of a couple, we played, what, three games of this? Two or three games? Yeah. It seemed like it's very hard to make those lists balanced. Like, sometimes I got a thing and I was like, oh, I can very easily distinguish that from the rest of the list. Yes. And sometimes you're like, wow, this and two other things are... Like, I got one where I had legend, but there was also myth and epic and fantasy and i just drew a guy with a sword and prayed for the best and it worked out but i had no clue how to differentiate those things you did it well (laughs) but yes that was difficult (laughs) yes so i mean sometimes i feel like you get luckier than other times for sure i had this i had disco ball once and sorry or no you had disco among other genres of music yes and you just drew a disco ball and it was so easy to to understand yeah yeah so, so the details not... are difficult, but the concept is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what really makes this worthwhile is the fact that it solves the Pictionary problem of only one person's drawing. Yeah. I don't think... I, I guess Telephone Pictionary is not a real game. Telestrations, it's not a real game. That's one way to get everyone drawing. This is a real game where everyone's drawing, and it's intense. Yeah, it's my favorite of those three by far. I think favorite in w- using which parameters? <laughs> it's it's what I enjoy playing the most. Okay, okay, yeah. I love Telephone Pictionary, but it's not a game. <laughs> I like it. It just takes way too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's Pictomania. Dungeon Pets. He also released in 2011. Is kind of sequel to Dungeon Lords, and he thinking about it, he basically takes the mechanism from Dungeon Lords and softens it a bit. Because both of them, you're bidding for your workers, for your, your worker placement. Well, the Dungeon di- Lords, yeah. you're just bidding with the order and timing of the so, cards yes. you play. So the, the difference is, so in Dungeon Pets, up front, you are secretly assigning groups of workers. And that determines the order that they're going. You can assign a group of three workers. Right. But if someone else really wants to go somewhere, they're going to put four workers in it. In, or five. In the, or five. Yeah. And sure, they can do fewer things, but they are you know they have a better chance of going first. Yeah. So and I, you don't commit what action you're playing. Exactly. Yeah. The actual action placement is a normal go-around worker, worker action thing. Honestly, the action placement, though, is really brutal in that there are fewer spaces. Dungeon Lords... Each action has three variants, whereas Dungeon Pets, you can just get shut out and you can't buy a pet. (laughs) Yeah, there's only one action that has more than one space. It's one of the buying a pets things. But I felt like the game overall is softened. Like, it's it's, it's a game in which everyone's going to score decently and one person's going to pull ahead. It's kind of easier to get points and do things yeah. dungeon lords you if you play poorly you can get really shut out yeah i the think the coolest thing about dungeon pets i think is the card system oh so yes the card system is really cool i really like the the action grouping the bidding the bidding i think that's really cool but, i think it's fine but, but you're right i think the, the card system is awesome yeah so you get these pets and you put them in cages and different cages do different things but they have a little spinner thing on them and you rotate that as the pet ages, and as the pet ages, it it shows additional cards of four of, one of four different colors. And when in, the round is over, you have to take care of your pets. And what you do is you have one of each color, basically, as your leftover. And you draw cards equal to whatever's showing on your pets. And then you have to allocate the different cards to the different pets based on what's showing. And each color of card has a a different distribution of things that the pets need. So maybe they'll poop on one of them or they need to be fed or they're going to try to escape or they're going to try to teleport to a new plane of existence if they're magic. Mm -hmm. Things like that. So it's a very kind of controlled random distribution 
Which is very clear. Which is very nice. And it's outlined on your player board so you can see. And then you have to allocate them. And then, you know, certain cages will be better at holding in violent attacks. And certain cages will have magic barriers. And you have to, like, send leftover imps to clean up poop. Or to track down the pets if they run away. And so that kind of, like... I think Jeff Ingolstein calls it pink noise, where okay. it's like, it's not completely controlled, but it's not an equal distribution. It's like a controlled distribution. Feels really nicely in terms of trying to partially control random outputs in how you arrange your pets and which pets you buy and such. Really pleasant game. Yeah. It doesn't get me excited, though. Yeah. Well, it's f- nice. Further on the, the card system it it allows you some forethought if you plan well into kind of how you're going to take care of your animals at at times in a way that lets you maximize points in certain ways and stuff like that right uh which is which is fun to set up Mm -hmm. okay so for me this hits the sweet spot more of a light-ish worker placement euro it's not light it's firmly medium okay okay fine (laughs) fine a medium on the light side of medium no No? (laughs) this is solidly medium weight i don't know okay whatever i mean we had a good teacher it's pleasant shout out to mark who's who's listening to our live stream yes taught the game very well but it's medium weight yes we both beat viticulture is easier than this game while mark's not here let's just make it clear that we both beat mark we were we were oh that's very true yeah, yeah we were definitely better pet i think honestly this is vlada's safest game I think it's the least exciting in terms of mechanisms. It feels more like other worker placement games. It That's does have true. a lot That's of theme. It's, and he does incorporate the theme well, but it doesn't seem as bold or daring as many of his it, designs. It's probably his least inventive, which is which is just ridiculous because how can you be so inventive in so many different game types? That a game about growing like fantasy monster pets yeah. to sell to yeah. characters from one of your other games yeah. feels safe. I, I'd say that it, this is it's just kind of a fine worker placement, pleasant. Like you said, it's not as harsh as, as Dungeon Lords. For me, it hits a nicer spot. I would enjoy playing this again. Yeah. The final game that Vlada made in 2011 is one of my favorites. One that if you listen way back to like podcast or something way in the early days of the Thoughtful Gamer, you will know that Matt thinks this game is merely fine, but that's Mage Knight, which Mage is Knight, Mage Knight. which is his first non-CGE game for quite a while. M- nearly all of his games starting in I believe I believe the first edition of Through the Ages was not CGE, but they picked it up later. And then since then, I think everything was CGE, at least of his major releases, until Mage Knight, which I believe was a contract job uh, from WizKids because they had the Mage Knight property from one of their Heroclix miniatures games. And they got Vlada to make a board game version of that, which ended up being way more popular than the miniatures game, which has since stopped being supported. And Mage Knight has continued to be supported. They've got a new kind of collector's edition coming out with the game and all of the expansions and a couple of card tweaks and art tweaks, I think, later this year. So Vlada kind of destroyed and revitalized the the franchise, I suppose. That's kind of appropriate for a Mage Knight. It's thematic. Mage Knights are not benevolent people. They are kind of agents of destruction ravaging the countryside and destroying cities and and conquering things. Again, we have a whole episode on this, but it takes the deck builder, which is, you know, we're, we're a few years out of dominion by this point in 2011. You know, he's probably designing it for a couple years because it's a, it's a very heavy game. And he takes the deck builder and basically puts it in slow motion for this adventure game. And I, I think it's really well done, but before I, I look things up for this podcast, I would have put the chronology very differently than it actually is. I thought Mage Knight was a lot older than 2011, to be honest. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I thought Pictomania was older. Um, I did think Pictomania was a lot older. I thought that the, like I said, I thought the space games were later than the dungeon games. But anyway, it gives me hope that he'll do another very heavy game in the future. I I can't remember where I heard this, but I believe last year I saw an interview with him and he said he was working on a Euro game. So we'll see. So that ends 2011. After 2011, we 
kind of enter a new era of Vlada production where a ton of expansions for the frankly outstanding list of games we saw in the past few, you know, in the previous few years. There's a bunch of expansions for Dungeon Pets, a ton for Galaxy's Trucker, a couple for Dungeon Lords, a significant one for Space Alert, a couple for Mage Knight. Uh, Through the Ages never got anything, but pretty much his other games that were popular got expansions starting in 2011 and going forwards at a pretty pretty good rate. And he kind of shifts from making two games a year to making a game about every other year. So we jump to 2013 and get to Tosh Kalar, which again, he shifts directions. And this is a gladiator game that has to do with like abstract pattern building. It's very interesting. And frankly, it's my least favorite of the Vlada games that I've played. At Vladicon, I think two years ago, Orion and I played two or three rounds of Tosh Kalar. And again, it's about setting up your like support units, these cardboard chits, in certain patterns to unlock attacks. So it kind of blends the space between a you know one-on-one combat game and an abstract game. You know how we were talking earlier about how Through the Ages is fun throughout its learning curve? Yeah. I think T- Tosh Kalar only gets fun when you're really into it and actually know what the patterns your opponents are were building towards are. Because yeah. if you don't know that information or have any guess at that information, you kind of sit there and just do plays back and forth. And then all of a sudden your opponent's like, aha, I unlocked this mega attack. And I had no way to know that was coming or move to stop it. And maybe, you know, it, we only needed a couple more plays to start getting to that point where we could predict those things. But, you know, it has like asymmetrical factions. And so you have to learn multiple factions. And I didn't feel like the learning curve was fun enough for me to get invested in the game. Although I can, I know there are some very diehard fans of Tosh Kalar out there and I completely understand why it's a really novel concept. Yeah. But you got to know the game, I think, to have fun with it. At least that was my impression after a couple of plays. It's it's just, I've never played it, but it's just really interesting to me that he would do this kind of abstract thing at this point. I, I think abstracts by nature aren't going to have the same wide audience. Right. And I think he's trying to get around that with having it presented with a theme. And one that kind of makes sense, but not really. But... Yeah, I mean, abstracts typically are fairly accessible to new players. Like, sure, on most, on a good abstract, an experienced player is going to kill a new player, but a new player can start to figure out some strategy typically. In Tosh Kalari, even after two or three games, I felt like I was kind of blindly mucking around trying to unlock things with no sense of strategy or tempo, which made it kind of fall flat for me. It was somewhat interesting, but I... Don't care if I ever play it again. Jump ahead two more years. We get through the age of second edition, which we've already talked a little bit about the changes there. And in 2015, we get Codenames, which is his biggest hit so far. Like, mass market, yeah, big hit. Won the spiel, right? Did it? I think I so. I believe so, yes. The I copy so. I have doesn't have that on the box, but... We, we had early copies. Early copies. Yeah. And frankly, a brilliant party game, a brilliant word game. Yeah, I mean, again, just taking on something completely different than anything else he's done. Right. And then got a mega hit. And And I'm really glad. Yeah. We were talking about this on the way back from Vladicon. I bet he's pulled in easily half a million dollars from Codenames and its various... I hope so. I hope so. I mean, that's, I think, a low estimate. Because I bet he's getting between 50 cents and a dollar a copy... And I think the original Code Games has easily sold a million copies. I don't know. I'm yeah, excited because so hopefully it, our it hope, frees him up yes. to build more zany, wild stuff we've never seen before. Like he's done throughout his career. Like I don't expect him to stop doing that, but he presumably has a new level of financial security from Code Names, and deservedly so. I mean, some people get annoyed that now there's like Marvel code names and Disney code names, but it's like, man, if you can rake in that money, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, it doesn't bother me that it exists. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to buy it, but go for it. Like, reach a new audience. Get people knowing the name Vladikovadl and CGE. They make quality stuff. 
Yeah, Codenames is great. We talked about a lot on the uh, Hindered Communication podcast yeah. and in other various ones. But yeah. if you, I mean, everyone listening to this, I'm sure knows at least what Codenames is. We love it. It's just it's it's just a marvel that such different experiences emerge from from these different games. Uh, in Codenames, I've said before, I think brings out creativity in in players in a way that maybe no other game does. Frankly, no game prior in his gameography. Yeah, I mean, maybe Pictomania a bit, Pictom- but... But really, I mean... That's it's more of a speed Pictionary. game. It's more yeah. of a speed game, yeah. I know the main complaint against Codenames from the few people who do not like it is that it's just a dull party game because there's lots of silence. But that has never been a problem for me. Like, if someone's taking a long time to give a clue, the other players start talking about things that have happened prior in the game yeah. or like funny things or how the words are arranged. Like it's just, I have played pic- it puts people in Sorry. such a fun space. Yeah. I've put, I've played code names with enough completely different types of groups that it's impossible to, I mean, it, it, it would be impossible to please more people. It works with almost everybody. Yeah. It's, they're not going to play it at like a college frat party, I guess. I mean, they might. That'd be I mean, a fun might. flat. I mean, we would have played it in, in our housing group yes. were it released. But I mean, that stereotypical, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to figure out who doesn't want code names, and it's uh, hard. Most of the main, two of the three main Dice Tower guys hate code. Or they don't hate it. They just don't understand the appeal. They, th- they think it's really dull, but I I think they're very dull. No, sorry. I, you guys see the <laughs> They're not listening to this. Uh, 2015 to 2017, you get a whole bunch of different versions of Codenames that I'm not going to talk about. Well, we we might mention Codenames Duet because we're having a bit of a discussion on it earlier that I think Codenames Duet is remarkably different in how it plays from regular Codenames. For sure, yeah. Like, regular Codenames is really about that kind of very simple push-your-luck of how many words... Can I get grouped under? Can I get them to effectively guess without risking giving the other team a point or hitting the assassin? Along with, you know, the creativity of figuring out the clue for that. Codenames Duet has that also, but the words are deliberately designed to be much more difficult to group. And you have the gaminess of, like, knowing that three of the three assassins that you see on your side of the image of the key... One of them will be a correct clue for you. One of them will be an, another assassin, and one of them will be neutral. Yeah, gaminess and is a good way to say it. It's they're, much more gamey. It's like a code names for gamers. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly not nearly as casual as regular code names. The nature of kind of being on equal footing with a single other person on the other side of the table j- just brings a different game dynamic. Yeah, I don't like it quite as much. Yeah. Based on a handful of plays. I think it's still very good, but the original code names just has so much more excitement going for it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's hard to compete with a game that's in my top 5, you know. I Codename sure. Duet was probably never going to be as good as Code Names. I like it in that it takes what Code Names did, which is I think brilliant, and it puts it in a different setting for me. It's no longer a party game. It's a game that I can play a little more slower paced with a single person. As the name might imply, I think it works great as a couples game. Mm-hmm. So I like it for that. It, it, it puts the the brilliance of Codenames in a different setting. It's good as a couples game if you have a patient, understanding couple. Or you uh, want to grow patience in your yes. relationship. I think Amber and I played about five games in a row, and I wouldn't let her stop until we won, because I was getting so frustrated. We do not click at all with our clues in code names, and after some of the clues, I'm like, how could you not get that? And she was the same way with me, and uh, I think we, we grew a bit. After we won. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Vlada. There we go. Co- thank you, Vlada. You've you've improved marriages across the world. <laughs> okay. Uh, other than all the Codenames versions that came out in 2016, Star Trek Frontiers came out, which is 
I, I always heard that it was Mage Knight just reskinned into Star Trek with very minimal changes. Someone at Vladicon mentioned that it was streamlined and more simple than Mage Knight, which piqued my interest a bit. So maybe there's enough distinction there that I might want to try it. But you should I was try never, it. yeah, I should try it. But I, I was never interested in buying it because I, I'm not a Trekkie and I love Mage Knight how it is. Yeah, but maybe I, if it's streamlined and they and they if, legitimately changed it quite a bit, it could be a, a new experience. I mean, I can't imagine you would like it more, but I mean, who knows? But given you know the described nature of changes. It's going in the direction that I want it to go. So, I, I mean, I'd be interested in seeing what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to see if we can play that at some point. Then in 2017, we get his first wholly original game since 2015 called That's a Question uh, with an exclamation point on the end, which is always worrying with a game when they put an exclamation point at the end. And it really hit the zenith with Clank in Space, which has an exclamation point after every word. And that ratio is simply unacceptable. But anyway, that's a question. I I haven't played it. I saw it being played. It's basically an icebreaker game. It's like, would you prefer if all the pianos disappeared from the earth or all of the peaches? That kind of thing. And you go around and there's some kind of rudimentary scoring system. Yeah, I still haven't figured exactly how the mechanics of it work. I'm not interested in it, really. Should get Ben to play it. Ben, I mean, if ben you have a, a group major... of people that you at a party that you don't really know, it might be really fun to get to know them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that kind Some of game. Some people just love icebreakers. Yeah. Um, and then the only other new game since then for 2018 is the aforementioned Pictomania 2nd Edition, which I will probably be getting a copy of because it looks to be very cheap. Wow, that that is great. That is our first complete chronological rundown of a game designer we went through the whole oeuvre they said oeuvre oeuvre i kind of split the difference on that one that's the whole rundown of all of his games even the really off the wall ones that no one has ever seen in real life except for the crazy person who put it up on bgg which was you know who knows could have been vlada himself we already talked about some of the groupings that he has so he obviously has the two space games which share a lot of similarities the two dungeon games, which are basically a game and its sequel. And then he has his, another grouping would be his party games, which seem fairly distinct. Bunny Buddy, Boost Moose, Pictomania, code names, and that's a question. Some of the other ones, you know, they're just kind of their own thing. Like there's nothing else I see that's similar to Mage Knight, really, or Through the Ages. But I wanted at the end of this podcast to go over some consistencies that I see in Vlada. Because he does have an extremely broad selection of games that he's designed. But I think we can tease out some things that follow through in many of those games. Or hold in many of those games. And I found five of them. I don't know if you thought more about this. Or if you have even looked at the ones I prepared. I've glanced through the ones that you've prepared. And they... uh, They seem fine? They seem... Good. <laughs> Maybe a little more than fine. So you're saying that my, my preparation here is better than Mage Knight? In that apples and orange scenario, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here are the consistencies, the Vlada design consistencies that I have found. The first one is humor, and you really can't deny it. A lot of his games are quite funny. Uh, you have Galaxy Truckers, Space Alert, Dungeon Lords, Dungeon Pets... Bunny Bunny Moose Moose and Pictomania, I think, are all distinctly funny in one form or the other. A lot of the Um, times the rule book helps with that. But frankly, the visual style or just the mechanics of the game. Like, Galaxy Trucker is funny just by the way it is. Which game do you feel is the funniest in in a holistic sense? It depends on, you know, it's, it's the, it's the good fellas scene. What kind of funny clown funny or, you know, I can't remember what he's, what Joe Pesci says in that scene, but like, there's a certain exalting humor of space alert that you're getting so worked up over something so dumb. Pictomania is just frantically hilarious. Mm-hmm. Galaxy trucker is kind of a, a is it schadenfreude kind of funny. Sure. If it's, your opponent's ship who's getting torn torn apart. Bunny Bunny Moose Moose just makes you do physically silly things. And everyone involved, the person reading the silly poem or the person putting their fingers yeah. up like, like bunny ears, they're all kind of 
diverse in their humor, except for Lords and Pets, which kind of share the same joke. Yeah. Which is the premise itself. But lots of different kinds of humor, and they're yeah. just funny. Like it's, It goes beyond fun into something that's actually humorous, which he does so well. The second one that I love, I love this about Vlada, and I don't think, I I didn't put a lot of thought to it, but I, I think this is something that he does, I think, better than anyone that I can think of. And that is making the complexity of the game itself part of the mechanism of the game. Yeah. So, for instance, in Galaxy Trucker, the pieces can be deliberately confusing to look at. They follow a logic, but there it's not necessarily a clean art style on those pieces. And that's part of the fun of the game is looking at those pieces in real time yeah. and deciphering what they're supposed to mean and if they're beneficial to you. Yeah. And th- the key here, which is true of Galaxy Trucker, but I think the others in the category, is that there's something about the game that prevents you from fully overcoming the complexity. And real the real time aspect is the is the the primary and, and true for Galaxy Trucker Space Alerts. Well, for all of them, they're all um, real time games in in one to one degree or another. Yeah, so many games where the complexity is something to overcome and to to understand. And when you're playing someone else, maybe you've overcome the complexity a little bit more, and so you have an advantage. But ultimately, it's just, it's something that you want to get past mm-hmm. and and understand the game. I'm trying to think of other games. I mean, to some sense, it's a function of a real-time game. So Millennium Blades would be a similar game to Space Alert in that it takes the process of looking at a card which adds new ideas and rules to the game, right? Which many card games do. They export a lot of the rules to the cards themselves. But it takes the process of figuring out what cards mean and makes that part of the challenge and fun of the game rather than an annoyance. So maybe it's more a real-time thing, but I can think of other real-time games where that's not really the case. You're just kind of racing against another person. Yeah, I think it's just how perfectly Vlada has has done these real-time games where it's just always fun to fight the clock against the madness in some way. I mean, look at Pictomania, right? If Pictomania was just those first level clues and those normal clues, which I think is something a lesser designer would have done, it would have still been an enjoyable game. Yeah. Right? Because you're still frantically racing against the other people. But the Vlada spin on that game is like trying to draw angst. Yeah. And I think... And and distinguish it from anger, you know? (laughs) I think this segues into your next point of inelegant design where a bit yeah where in pictomania a fairly simple concept of a game those those fourth level clues are ridiculous like why would you want to force someone to try to dis- distinguish between those things but it ends up being it ends up really working well yeah it, yeah so the the next one is inelegant design which you might think and to some people i'm sure is a criticism But it's something that I think he does very well in that he makes games that sometimes are quite difficult to learn and have lots of edge case rules and just lots of things to remember about them. The three biggest culprits are Through the Ages, Mage Knight, and Dungeon Lords. However, all three of those games, I don't feel like it ever gets to a point where that inelegance harms the experience of the game. Rather, it makes them more enjoyable. There are aspects of Through the Ages, again, that don't seem particularly sleek, but they add either, usually both, a thematic and a mechanical purpose to the game. And therefore, they seem integral to the design, but they're not necessarily elegant. Dungeon Lords has lots of little rules about how the champions move through the dungeon and how the order of operations of how that plays out, but it makes the game very challenging and logical. It's just not particularly elegant. And then Mage Knight is famously complex, but part of the enjoyment of the game is figuring your path through that complexity. So why is it that Vlada is able to 
inject these inelegant bits into his games in a net positive way. I mean, I don't think he's alone in this. Like, Twilight Imperium does this. Like, it thrives on this. It's kind of this really nice blend of a Meritrashy thematicness where he really wants to do these little bits and pieces in the game. You know, the evilometer in Dungeon Lords and, you know, the distinction between how ghosts in the game have different functions and how they can operate in the room compared to vampires. Little stuff like that, that maybe he just has enough clout with CGE that they trust him enough where they don't force him to edit out those those extravagancies, whereas a lesser designer, it would be eradicated in the development phase. I don't know how that works, but it feels like something that would be edited in other games, mostly. Yeah. You know, there there are other games that have those elements, but it's it's charming to me in Vlad, and it makes kind of unique experiences. Yeah, and I don't think, I wouldn't describe any of his games as clunky other than maybe Mage Knight. Yeah. It's almost an economical use of these inelegant systems <laughs> well it's like when you read an author who maybe you know who who goes on and, and creates really extravagant prose right you can tell the distinction between someone who does that well and someone who does that poorly mm-hmm. like one of them yes it's extravagant and it's bloated a bit but it's it's enjoyable to just read that prose and for someone else it just becomes exhausting yeah. Vlada, I think, tends to do it very well. It's With rem- exceptions, though. Codenames is extremely elegant. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's remarkable that the same thing is, is evident in such vastly different games. Absolutely. The fourth thing I found, the fourth consistency I found is he has some games that are very mean. And I... I mean mean on a player-to-player level. We already talked about some games that are mean on in that the game treats you meanly and, and is complex and you have to overcome Space that complexity. Alert. I'm talking about games where you can just beat down your opponent really hard. Through the Ages is definitely an unforgiving game. Very mean. In some ways, Mage Knight is. I haven't really played it competitively, but there's not really any catch-up mechanism there for Mage Knight. Tosh Kalar is very mean uh, in just that it's a direct head-on-head battle. But it also, I don't think, has really any catch-up mechanisms. And then Dungeon Lords. Like, if you get a string of bad luck or bad predictions there, you can get really stomped into the ground with Dungeon Lords. And, you know, you can have a situation where your dungeon was just com- literally destroyed, in usually in the first round. There's not a lot of coming back from that. So some of his games are just extremely punishing. If you don't play well. I mean, through the ages more than most. I remember one time I tried playing online in a two-player game. And I believe I ended up with like negative 70 points. The guy built up a stronger military and then spent all of his efforts squashing me into the ground. He had like 300-something points and I had negative 70. And you can do that in through the ages. So he doesn't shy away from that. And then the final consistency that I found, which is, I think, a lesser thing, but something he likes to do, is have games with multiple levels of success. So distinctly, in two of his competitive games, Galaxy Trucker and Dungeon Lords, he says, in the rules, if you score positive points, you have won the game. And that's your goal. And part of that's just trying, you know, in a punishing game, trying to get people to reframe their expectations, but I think it's part of his design philosophy that he's made these games such that the game mechanisms themselves are challenging enough that you don't necessarily need to worry so much about beating out your opponents until you've learned the game more. And then Space Alert, you have varying levels of success in terms of like doing a perfect mission or doing a mission without anyone getting killed or just surviving a mission. <laughs> yeah, and then that that's extended by the achievements in the expansion. Where right. You're trying right. to go to even further levels of success. And it's not just merely a point or experience system. There are different levels of success. Yeah. And they affect things like if you're doing a campaign or getting certain achievements in the expansion. Yeah, the same is kind of true of Mage Knight almost. Like, I mean, Mage Knight is... I, binary you could have you can make up different levels of success but imagine 
kind of at the, least in the cooperative scenarios, you either win or lose. There yeah, is a point system, but the you can yeah. go for a high score. I, I, I guess kind of the, the feeling of powerfulness can vary a little bit. I remember playing a game where we barely squeaked by. Yeah, yeah. and then I know from hearing you guys talk of games where you just absolutely obliterated the you know the in the I mean, last on turn. easy <laughs> on sure, easy sure yeah but it doesn't have those plateaus of different levels of success yeah that's not a defined success thing to conjecture a bit i wonder if that comes from his video game background where levels of difficulty are a thing and just enjoyment of the video game is kind of its own thing you know and you can go beyond that to the completionist thing i don't know perhaps i wonder if the complexity and inelegance it comes from video games also because you know video games can have more mechanisms because they can do a lot of the computation under the hood so i yeah. wonder if his early drafts of games are just a huge degree more bloated and he, and the end point that we see seems a bit inelegant but he's edited out already a ton yeah maybe. i don't know i don't know how he does it i know he does he does program his games on a computer to test them yeah maybe I mean, that's one thing that I think of Vlada. I don't know if this would be a sixth category of consistency is I think of his games in terms of kind of a programmed system. Now, this is really just because I know that that's in his history. But like, I don't know. I think of Mage Knight as kind of a a video game system. and But really, that's the only one. Yeah, through the ages, for sure. Yeah, I guess those might be the main two. I don't know if there's anything else to tease out from that. It's unique in that I think of his games in that way, but that's also just because I know that that's in his background. Sure, yeah. I think that's all we've got on Vlada. That was an enjoyable dive into our favorite designer. Hopefully, I will get to a point where I can do this with more designers. I think this is a fun format for a podcast. Yeah, this is definitely the one that that I've wanted to do for a long time. So we're not going to go through our complete list, but what... Would you consider your top tier Vlada games? My you, top tier had... would be my first four. I think those I okay. would consider masterpieces. So that'd be Mage Knight, Space Alert, Through the Ages, and Code Names. Yeah, okay. How about you? My top three, which would be Code Names, Space Alert, and Through the Ages. There we go. We can yeah. agree on on those three, and Mage yeah. Knight can be my anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I have to say, I want to play more Through the Ages. Oh really? I do. Let's do it like this weekend. Yeah. I'm thinking about Ryan's buying here. I'm thinking about buying the app. Oh no. We should play this weekend though. <laughs> Let's get a Ryan in on that and play some through the ages. I'm always down to play that game. All right, that is our discussion on Vlada. Maybe someday I haven't tried, but maybe someday we can get Vlada in on the podcast. That would be a dream come true. Maybe I should just try and contact him but i think that was pretty interesting and there are a couple of those games i haven't played yet some of the lesser titles that i'm I'm now really interested in playing but thanks for listening everybody don't forget to rate and review this podcast on itunes or wherever you get podcasts check out the thoughtful gamer for all kinds of reviews and other articles along with Uh, these podcasts and maybe some video stuff coming out soon check me out on social media on twitter on facebook where i post things all the time and random thoughts that come into my head as is appropriate for social media and if you would like to join the group of people here watching the podcast and commenting and interacting with us and throwing out bits of knowledge that we have forgotten thanks guys join our patreon at patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer we have unlocked quarterly giveaways Uh, we hit that goal which is so exciting and i already gave away my first game Uh, they got pioneer days which i will be reviewing soon and uh, they're enjoying it i believe uh, our, our our winner if you would like to be part of that and join our community which i think is wonderful again that's patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer we will talk to you all again soon goodbye Good night.